very much. It's lovely to be back at, uh, at, at LitFest for the fourth year. Um, as Ella says, uh, I, I, I used to go to work with uh, a white horsehair wig on my head. So very little has changed, really. Um, but I, I, used to be, I used to be a barrister, so I'm, I'm actually a recovering lawyer, really. And um, when I started writing about food, um, I did attempt to explain it to my parents. Uh, I come from Northern Ireland, which is an extremely conservative society, and they were completely and utterly dumbfounded, you know. And several years later, when they started talking to me again, you know, they'd say, why, why would you write about food, you know? What is there to write about? Really genuine mystification, you know? And I, I used to try to explain that actually food relates to everything uh, and that everything you can write about, political, social, cultural, uh, food will give you an opportunity to do it, you know? Um, <clears throat> I'm lucky enough, I, I read a column once, roughly once a month in the Irish Times, in the health pages, which means when everybody advises the, the, you know, the nation to drink pasteurized milk, I, I can be able to come out and say, actually, you should get raw milk from your whole food shop, from a good farmer. And when everybody's being told that the low-fat diet is actually the way to go, I'm lucky enough to be able to come out and say, actually, do you know what? Low-carb, high-fat is actually the way to go. And I managed to get away with it. I've got away with it for a very, very long time. But one of the curious things that happened um, <clears throat> when, when I was a lawyer, I used to review books. I, I used to write music journalism for a magazine called Hot Press in Dublin. Hot Press, miraculously, is still going. And the reason why its existence is miraculous is because I once wrote for it, right? And my music journalism is the worst journalism in the history of journalism, right? I mean, think of every offense that you can do against grammar, syntax, and sense. And I committed all of those sins on a weekly basis, on a fortnightly basis, in everything I wrote. But, the, the, and, and I got paid for it. But the beauty of it was, I mean, I think it was Norman Mailer who once said, if you want to be a writer, write a million words. And after you've written a million words, you're a writer. And you need to do that. You need to write all the bad stuff out. And you need to find the people who help you find your voice. So, as well as writing um, about music, I used to review books. And one day, and I don't know why, I ticked a little list I had received from Penguin Books of future copies. And I ticked a book, a list that said, uh, forthcoming edition of a book called Simple French Food by a man called Richard Olney. There you are, there's a little place in Tipperary. And I had never heard of Richard Olney, and I had never heard of Simple French Food. And I don't know why I ticked the book. And then I got the book, and I kind of opened it, uh, and was looking through it, and I noticed a recipe for <coughs> Eggs scrambled with tomato and basil. And I thought, you don't put tomato and basil with scrambled eggs. You, know, you might put some mushrooms or a bit of bacon, but tomato and basil? No, you don't do that. So it so intrigued me that it seemed so strange that I thought, well, we better try that. And of course, you know, it completely blew my mind. But what also blew my mind was, <clears throat> was this, this sort of prose. Because what's interesting about Richard Olney, he was from Iowa. He was born in 1927, he died in 99. He's a huge hero to American food lovers. Uh, he lived in, uh, for most of his life in Provence, a little town called Solier Touca. I was lucky enough many, many years ago to, to have lunch with him, uh, with my wife Sally. Uh, the three of us consumed heroic amounts of wine uh, during a beautiful, beautiful lunch. And then we got, I don't know how we got back on the train, but we did get back on the train. And uh, he was a, a wonderful man, but I think partly because when he started writing about food, he was writing in French. He'd write sentences like this. So he's writing here about scrambled eggs, okay? And he says, correctly prepared, the softest of barely perceptible curds held in a thickly liquid, a thickly liquid, not a thick liquid, a thickly liquid. You know, if you're a writer, your knees wobble when you read that. You know, it's a thickly liquid, like a really good olive oil. Thickly, not thick. Correctly prepared, the softest of barely perceptible curds held in a thickly liquid, smooth, creamy suspension, scrambled eggs number among the very great delicacies of the table. They, like omelets, should be beaten but lightly with an addition of butter and, whether they are prepared over low direct heat or in a bain-marie, 
their cooking utensil immersed in another containing nearly boiling water. They should be contained in a generously buttered heavy pan, preferably copper, which absorbs, the heat, which absorbs heat slowly and retains it for a long time. And I just thought, wow, how on earth do you write about, that is sexy writing. Do you know what I mean? Sexy egg, God, give it to me now. <laughs> Go out and get the tomatoes and the basil. Uh. And the other thing I think that Olney's great book did, he wrote many other books. He was a very unusual food writer in that he was also an incredibly fine wine writer. And generally those two disciplines don't cross over. He wrote great books on, on the kind of wines that I can't afford to drink. You know, Romani Conti, Chateau de Chem. Uh, he also wrote a huge series for Time Life books called The Good Cook, which is no fewer than 27 volumes. Do I own all 27 volumes? I do. How many copies of Simple French Food do I own? I have four. The original copy, if I took it off the shelf, would just fall apart. I managed to get a hardback. This is the most recent edition, which you might find. <coughs> it's a facsimile edition from Grub Street Publishers in the UK. But I suppose... Um, one of the things, you know, you're always having this conversation with your parents when your parents say, what is there to write about food? It's food, you know? Come on. And Richard Olney say, explained, because he's trying here to explain the concept of simple food. And of course, a lot of the recipes in simple food are actually pretty darn complicated. It doesn't matter. And he said this, <clears throat> two, par two little paragraphs and then I'll finish. Simple food. A dreary old cliche has it that one should eat to live and not live to eat. It is typical that this imbecile concept, a deliberately fruitless paradox born of the Puritan mind, should deny sensuous reaction at either pole. And it is fortunate that neither pole really exists, for man is incapable of being either altogether dumbly bestial or altogether dumbly mental. And he then says, I have sometimes been accused of thinking of nothing but food and wine, of being bound irreparably to the bestial pole. I do, in fact, think a great deal about food and wine, <clears throat> and I would like my readers to share with me the belief that food and wine must be an essential aspect of the whole life, in which the sensuous, sensual, spiritual elements are so intimately interwoven that the incomplete exploitation of any one can only result in imperfection. And I think after I read that, I knew that my days as a lawyer were numbered because I was after the sensuous, sensual, spiritual elements to be so intermittently interwoven that the incomplete exploitation of any one can only result in imperfection. So it's a pleasure at LitFest to hopefully introduce you to Richard Olney. Thank you. <clears throat>